Thank you very much, Marianne, for these kind words of introduction. And it really is a great pleasure to be here today and to give you this kind of opening wel welcome address. I mean, it's, a, it's a personal mission of mine to have more integration between the medical community and the water community and the wash community. And that's partly because uh, of in my family, my sister is a doctor. And since our student days, which is now far too long ago, we've both been really interested in global health, her from the medical perspective and me from the water supply uh, perspective. So this really is a, a personal thing for me and it's great to have this, this, this integration. So I can tell my sister as well that I'm still doing my bit and speaking to, to people with an interest in, in medical things as well. So what I'm going to do to, in the next 10-15 minutes is just look at the underlying water resources and this is for Africa. I'm the uh, a hydrogeologist with the British Geological Survey and I've worked for about 20 years on groundwater resources particularly in Africa but also a little bit in Asia and I'm going to try and look at this question is there really enough water in Africa to provide good sustainable water supplies now as Marianne said I got into a lot of trouble uh, about 18 months ago with a uh, publishing an article that's got an awful lot of uh, press coverage saying there's masses of water in Africa. Don't worry, it's all there, there's loads of it. And uh, this still gets me into trouble today. A lot of my colleagues, my groundwater scientists say, how could you say that, for goodness sake? Don't tell people the water's out there. But uh, it was a result of a lot of careful research, which I hope to demonstrate to you. And there are, of course, qualifications, which were picked up by some of the, 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 the newspapers. I particularly like the, the new civil engineer, which is the top right-hand corner there, whose title was careful in, uh, in, in developing groundwater resources in Africa. They might run out. So they're the only one that picked up the qualification. All the rest of them were. There was lots of water there. So why did I do that in the first place? Well, it was in response to these and similar studies on global water stress, which are very useful studies, but I think give a very jaundiced view of the availability of water resources. So this is a, a map of global water stress by Boris Marty and his team, which show lots of red areas, water, huge water stress, particularly for Africa. And this has generated also among donors and within DFID, a lot of concern that should we really be developing groundwater uh, water resources for people if they're going to run out, if we've got so much water st stress, is this going to really damage the environment? And that just made me and a number of my colleagues mad because actually what it's doing is looking at the surface water resources mainly, looking at the rivers and how, how they, they dry up and looking at the, the, the rainfall and not really looking deeper. So we wanted to add in this deeper side to the story to give a more balanced view of the availability of water resources to, to be developed. So I have to look deeper. Looking at the groundwater resources gives you a much more complicated picture, but less pessimistic. And I think we all need a bit of optimism, particularly if you're involved in WASH or neglected tropical diseases. And being from the British Geological Survey, I have <coughs> pictures of rocks. I will not test any of you just now on which they are, but there could be a prize if somebody can name what these five are afterwards. So at the break, come afterwards and see if you can name each one of these rock types, and I'll see if I can get you a BGS prize. I'll leave it up for a couple more seconds. Anyway, why are we here? And why are we so interested in the, in the availability of water resources? And this is just to, you know, just to remind ourselves of the, the, the burden that people are still facing in terms of water supply. The, the 350 million people or so who are still getting their water supplies from uh, ponds or, or, or surface water which, which is contaminated. I'm really looking forward to hearing more evidence and studies today of uh, detailed research into how this is affecting people's lives. But also the burden of walking for water and the, the toll this takes on health and makes people more vulnerable towards diseases. And of course, the weights that people are carrying, the, the sort of 30 or 40 kilograms routinely carried by, by women to, 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 to get the water they require. And the, the effect on, on children, the, the education losses that are, are still being seen today 
So, as well as neglected tropical diseases, the real water and wash is still, I think, neglected in terms of the, the impact it can have on people's health and people's livelihoods, and particularly the poor and most marginalised across the world. So, Paul Hunter, Richard Carter and I uh, developed a little bit of work as part of a series that uh, Sandy Cairncross was involved in, uh, in, in publishing a series of papers on improved wash and its impact on health. And uh, this very generalised graph shows a, a relationship between infant mortality and uh, the lack of access to clean water. And of course, there's loads of caveats with this research. But what we found at this large uh, meta-analysis, so this kind of high scale, is that even for countries with the same GDP, or for countries with the same GDP, uh, access to water was improving health. So at this high level, it looked like countries that invested in WASH would have better health. And again, I'm, we really need a lot more research in this on the detail uh, of how actual individual diseases are affected by <coughs> water supply or sanitation service, services or hygiene. There's a lot of work to be done to gather that evidence base at the local level, real evidence base that can convince uh, the medical community and others that WASH services really do have that impact. So we need a lot of more detailed research on funding for that. So we developed these maps to try and inform this, this debate. And, and we, we started off with some geological maps of, of Africa, uh, developed uh, over, over the years by, uh, by UN agencies and uh, adapted by us at the Geological Survey. There is a lot of groundwater information out there, but it was disparate, it's spread around, it's hidden in, in, in offices in, uh, in different countries. A lot of it's hidden in offices in Europe of the old colonial powers. They've got maps here, there and everywhere which weren't available. And we were determined to get that information out and available for, for people. So these are maps of groundwater resources for individual countries. And all this information is now available uh, and on the web. And we, we looked at what studies were available on groundwater resources. Uh, and we did a proper systematic review that uh, pe people should be, should be happy with to, to look at this data and what that, that means. And then we carried out some case studies, some rapid case studies in three target areas, looking at rural water supplies, much higher yielding supplies, and also taking apart communities to see how uh, access to water was improving health and livelihoods. So our answers were, as uh, Marianne said, there's lots of water out there. Huge amount of groundwater storage, uh, a million cubic kilometres, which is, which is a lot. It's uh, 10 times the annual rainfall across Africa. It's about 30 times the amount of water stored in the lakes and rivers in Africa. But it is dominated to these North African basins, or the big sedimentary basins. But even in the, the more populated parts of Africa, there are sufficient groundwater resources to support hand pumps. So maybe five times the, the amount of water annually used by a hand pump can be stored in the immediate vicinity of, of that hand pump. So there's a lot of groundwater storage in there. And uh, I would argue that that should be used in water security assessments. We should take these resources into, into account. But actually, it isn't evenly distributed and Getting water supplies at work means you've got to get the water out. So this map shows uh, uh, how much water you might get out of a water source, from yellow and orange, which is very low, to blue, which is very high. And the, the reason that that's important is that you then have to target your technologies. There's no point in saying, we're going to drill lots of boreholes, do a big urban water supply, and you're in one of these yellow areas. You're not going to find the groundwater. And there's countless examples of, of, of investments being made for new water supply which haven't accounted for the groundwater resources. So you need to understand that, that variability. So this kind of diagram shows this, the variability at a local level. You need to know what you're doing to develop water supplies. You, it's, you can't really drill randomly. You need to have the expertise. And again, there's a good uh, analogy with the, with the medical community. You don't want untrained people to go out and uh, start administering medicines. You don't want untrained people to try and put in water supplies or they'll fail. And we've got 30 to 50% failure rates of 
water supply initiatives. Even now, after you know, 30, 40 years after the water decade, we still have that high level of failure. So the expertise is needed, and we need to look at capacity building and training for that. So there's techniques like geophysics and drilling, collecting information when you drill, uh, testing water to see how sustainable it will be, and you know, there are resources and books available for that. So just to kind of wrap up a little bit, what, what are we looking at in the, the geological sur survey now? Well, we're involved in a lot of projects trying to add texture to the water situation in Africa, doing a lot more detailed studies, working with a lot of African universities and other partners. And one thing that we're interested in is, is, is groundwater sustainability. Yes, the storage is there in some areas, but how sustainable could water supplies be? What will declining water tables mean? Will they decline? And the reason why we'd worry about that is the increasing costs. If your water levels decline, then it's a lot more expensive to get the water out. It does have a big impact on ecosystems and on rivers. You can have source failure as the water table declines. And competing demands, particularly the, the narrative around food security, where people are wanting to increase the amount of water used for irrigation, that could have impacts on wash services. And I think we as a community need to be very aware of what food security might mean for availability of water resources for, for people to drink. And it's something we, 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 a debate we should be involved in. We've done a little bit of work look at using satellites to try and understand sustainability at this, this sort of very high level because there isn't the evidence out there of measurements of, of water, water table throughout, throughout the, the continent. Again, something we're trying to do something about. But looking from satellites uh, to look at variations in gravity, the amount of water available, we actually found that an interesting, surprising picture. We've got two basins here where we're seeing long-term changes in groundwater resources. But the interesting thing about that is that actually the water resources are increasing. So rather than decreasing, as they are in parts of India, these two basins, actually water resources is increasing. So reasons for optimism, at a local level, you can get groundwater levels declining at an over-exploitation if too many water sources are together. But at this kind of continent level, Africa at the moment is still not seeing much decline in its overall groundwater resources, unlike some other continents. So there is reason for optimism there, but a huge amount of research needed at a local level to see what's happening. And we've got to consider the emerging quality issues. Arsenic and fluoride, such a devastating uh, issue in, in Asia. Yes, there are issues in, in Africa too. Fluoride, the development of water resources, might lead to much higher fluoride. Salinization of water resources can de devastate wash facilities. Nitrates and pesticides, looking at uh, the urban contamination, and a, a kind of sort of growing concern of mine, the link between on-site sanitation and water resources. You know, the latrines do link up with water sources, and we need a lot more research on that too. So just to, to wrap up my, my rapid uh, overview of the underlying water resources for Africa, groundwater is going to be fundamental to improve access to drinking water. The water resources are there. There are large volumes of water there, but they're not always easy to access. They're not evenly distributed, and you need, a lot of, you need local good expertise to, to put wash services in that are sustainable. The potential is there for small-scale development, small uh, water supplies, hand pumps and such like. But if you're looking for big water supplies, you need a lot more investment to try and find where to site these, these sources. We need to manage these things carefully. Because, uh, because of the issues round about water quality and sustainability. I'd like just to mention a new, new program. Uh, in fact, the deadline <laughs> for submission for these grants was, is today at four o'clock. So uh, when, I, when I accepted the invitation to do this, I thought, well, I'll have my grant submission for the two, two million pounds. I'll have it ready the week before, no problem. So on the sleeper train last night, I did not sleep. I was in the lounge car down from Edinburgh doing my final, final bits for my JES submission, which was submitted at 7.45 this morning. So it was in there. But uh, look out for that as a community. There, there, there's about 10, 12 million pounds of, uh, of, of research being funded as part of this. And it should be developing a lot of interesting results that should be of use to the community. So please stay, stay engaged with that. And just, just, to, just to finally say, 
It's so important for us to work together. Uh, we are interested in the same things, the WASH community and, and the health community. As Marianne said, that we need to work interdisciplinarily. We don't want to be uh, fighting our own corners, fighting amongst ourselves. Gosh, even within the WASH community, you get the sanitation, the water supply, the hygiene people. We can all have a little bit of a go. But we should be working together as much as we can towards these common goals. So like Charlie Brown here, and, and sometimes I... I think I'm beginning to look more and more like him as I get older. Being carried along by our colleagues from different disciplines, let's make sure we work together. And I'm really pleased that this conference is happening, which will hopefully facilitate that. Thank you very much.